Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Martin Furlong. I'm head of the Marine Autonomous Robotic Systems Group here at uh, the National Oceanography Centre. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about the future of ocean exploration. So 150 years ago, uh, HMS Challenger went out and was regarded as the first oceanographic cruise um, in the modern era. So this was a three year expedition and the science gathered during that uh, cruise is still used today. So some of the temperature and salinity measurements are still referenced even now. Today, oceanographic research vessels are still an essential part of us understanding the world's oceans. They will go out with a large team of scientists who will measure the water and the marine life on the bottom of the ocean to improve our understanding of the planet. However, as we've moved forward with technology, the research ships are, and the understanding we gain from them is also augmented by the information we get from satellites. Um, which allow us to study the surface of the ocean and autonomous aerial vehicles, which also allow us to study the surface of the ocean in very high de detail. Along with the, uh, those remote sensing capabilities, we use ocean models to allow us to understand how the water masses move within the ocean and how the biology within that ocean changes. These models allow us to uh, target where we do our measurements and allow us to improve the impact of research cruises that we go out on. Alongside the, the ships, the models and the in situ measurements and or the remote measurements from satellites, we also supplement this with robotics platforms. One of the key element or key pieces of robotic technology which is used are the Argo floats. Now these allow us to study the internal structure of the ocean. They have sensors which measure temperature and sort of saltiness or salinity of the of the water and they will descend to 2000 meters and then every 10 days come up doing a profile through the ocean and they will send that data back via satellite and that allows us the 4000 floats within the world's oceans allow us to understand how those water masses are moving alongside the Argo float robotic platforms we also have ocean gliders ocean gliders uh, basically glide through the water column whereas the Argo floats are just drift with the currents the gliders will actually make themselves heavy and they have little wings which allow them to fly through the water column when they get to about a thousand meters they will pump out a, a chunk of oil from the glider and that will make the glider more buoyant and they will then fly up through the through the water column gliders um, are typically just use temperature and salinity sensors, but there's a vast array of other sensors which have been added to these uh, platforms. They've been used for measuring boundary currents, and these are the sort of water masses as they sweep along sort of continent or by the, uh, the continents. Um, they are also used for storm measurements. So there's a whole load of work which has been done in the southern United States looking at hurricanes. And so by using gliders, you can uh, assess the in, uh, intensity of the, uh, the hurricanes because you can't do that using models or satellite data. So they are forming an important part of understanding the impact of hurricanes in the, in the US. Along with uh, the boundary currents and the storms, they're also being used for looking at water mass transformations. And so this is, as you get these packets of water as they move through the ocean, through eddies and other, um, other mechanisms, these packets will change. And so looking at how those water masses change and how they mix is another critical part of us understanding the oceans. And finally, they're also being used for measuring ocean health. An example of this is that they will have acoustic systems on there, which will allow you to listen for um, whales and understand how the whales are sort of moving in a given area. Alongside the Argo floats and the gliders, we're also developing the next generation of long range platforms. Examples are the vehicles behind you. Um, these, are, th these are auto sub uh, long range vehicles and they sit somewhere between a glider and a high power shorter range AUV. So these vehicles will go faster than gliders, but they will still dive to some of them. We have two flavors. One dives to, dives to 6,000 meters, which is six kilometers beneath the water surface. And the other one, which is slightly shallower, dives to 1,500 meters beneath the water surface. So just slightly beneath, below a mile in depth that it will go to. They have ranges of 2,000 and 6,000 kilometers and endurance of maybe one to sort of two and a half months. Um, they are faster than gliders. They have a bigger payload, so they will carry more sensors. All the vehicles I've mentioned, they act as taxis for sensors. And so they're not linked to 
specific sensors. They will add different sensors depending on what the science requirements are. So that de describes what we have at the moment. So one of the other things about the auto sub long range platform is that because it's slightly, um, it has more power, it also has more computing capability. So gliders uh, and Argo floats are quite limited in what they can actually do on board and what they can process. Whereas the auto sub long range platform, it can, uh, with the sensor data, it can do a lot of work to actually understand meaning from that data. And so there's work going on at the moment to try and extract information from that from the, the data that's collected to send that information back. So as an example, if you take a camera image, you really want to sort of know what's in the image. You don't just want to send all the pixels back. So the processing power of auto sub long range, as well as being able to uh, analyze the data, it also gives it extra understanding of the, of the surroundings. And this allows you to get closer to um, the seabed, but also um, we use these vehicles to go under the ice. And so allow you to get quite close to the ice edge as well. And so as we, uh, as the sensor payload improves and the autonomy within the vehicle improves, you'll get a better situational awareness so you can move these platforms to, and the sensors that they carry into areas that we can't currently go. So that was, that was now. Um, if we look to the future of uh, oceanographic observations, um, there's a whole drive to reduce the carbon impact of measuring the oceans. And so we've recently undertaken a research study looking at the net, next generation net zero oceanographic capability. So the upshot of this is that we need to reduce the carbon impact of the ships um, and the carbon impact of the, uh, of the oceanographic measurement capability. The ships currently burn about 11 tonnes of marine gas oil a day, uh, which generates about 50 tonnes of CO2 a day. So the next generation of research ships are going to have to change. Our expectation is that they will move on to using green fuels. Um, but one of the challenges of using green fuels is that the, um, the amount of uh, the size of your, your fuel tank needs to increase because the energy density within the green fuels is, is a lot less than it is within uh, marine gas oil at the moment. So what that will mean if we want to keep the same size ships is that we will need to reduce the amount of crew that actually go to sea with these vessels. We're still expecting a, a, a reasonable large number of crew who will go actually go with these vessels, but through the um, integration of low earth orbit satellites and improved satellite communication, we would expect that we can send less people to sea to support marine science while still doing the, the critical oceanography that, we'll be, um, that we do currently. As well as um, changes to green fuels and the uh, next generation of research ships, they will be complemented by uh, an enhanced set of uh, marine robotics platforms. And so the Argo program will continue to evolve. We're expecting Argo, um, the marine gliders also to um, expand in their usage as we add new sensors, uh, new capabilities to the vehicle. There's a whole load of really exciting stuff happening around um, sort of autonomy and sort of like uh, machine learning algorithms and uh, AI systems within these platforms, which will make them far more capable. And also a huge amount of work that's being done on the next generation of sensors, which will allow us to miniaturize and put these sensors into these platforms. As well as the, um, the glider program, we're also expecting the uh, systems like the auto sub long range platform to become a lot more common. And so we're expecting in the next 10 or 15 years for a huge explosion in these marine robotics systems, which will be measuring our, our, our oceans, both the shallow oceans on the shelf and also the deep oceans. We're also envisaging things like um, potentially petrol stations throughout the ocean, but they won't be petrol stations, they'll be recharging stations for these vehicles. So you could imagine that they will, you will deploy from the UK, they will go to the sort of middle of the Atlantic, uh, potentially recharge in the Atlantic and then carry on to the eastern seaboard of the, the US, continually measuring as they're going along. So complementing these in situ measurements, there will also be a, a whole expansion of satellite um, measurements which will increase so there'll be new satellite systems developed which will continue to measure the uh, the oceans that we have and the um, the atmosphere 
and finally that will be linked into the uh, next generation of ocean models. So these will be digital twins of the ocean which will be informed by in situ measurements and satellite data. And in preference to just fully understanding the oceans by looking at the in situ measurements, you'll actually look at the, or try and understand the oceans by actually inspecting the oceanographic model. But you know that that model is being, is accurate because it's being updated by these in situ measurements. So it's really exciting times and there'll be a huge transition um, towards the next generation of uh, ocean observing systems over the next 10 or 15 years. And our hope is that in 150 years time, the measurements that we will be making now, very similar to the Challenger expedition, will be informing our understanding of the oceans um, at that point. So I'm now going to hand over to John, who will talk to you about the sensors that we can put on these platforms and how that can help our understanding of the science of the world's oceans. My name is John McQuillan and I'm a molecular biologist at the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton. So the autonomous robots like the one behind me that let us get to the most remote and dangerous parts of the ocean also allow us to take new and more complicated equipment on board. This means we can measure new things and crucially we can ask new scientific questions. For example, today and in the future, we will send out machines that work as samplers. These can be programmed to collect and preserve the microscopic life forms and other small particles that we find in seawater. This means that we can then study them back in the laboratory. This is the robotic cartridge sampling instrument, or ROXI. It is a state-of-the-art sampling robot. It can be put into underwater vehicles, used alone on a mooring, or towed behind a boat, or even used on a bench in a laboratory. It allows us to collect samples from the furthest reaches of the ocean, including up to six kilometres underwater, where the pressure and low temperature would stop most systems from working effectively. It can carry thousands of small filters, which are made with holes so small they can only be seen under a powerful microscope and each one can collect a unique scientific sample. When left in one place, Roxy can collect samples over a course of time, or towed along, Roxy can be used to create a map of the ocean based on what we find on the filters. When Roxy is activated, all of the microscopic life in that water is collected and then covered with a chemical that keeps them in suspended animation until we can get them back to the lab. Roxy then stores that filter away and takes another ready to collect another sample. To keep all of the sampling tubes clean, Roxy can pump a bleach solution through the entire system between each sample. Then back in the lab, scientists can use the very latest techniques to find out what these microorganisms on the Roxy filters are and what they are doing. This is hugely important because the smallest of creatures are actually some of the most important for all life on the planet. If we look at these microbes under a microscope, we can see that there are many different shapes and sizes, but that doesn't tell us anything about what they do. Sometimes we want to look for microbes that are harmful, including ones that produce poisons that get into our seafood or ones that can cause disease. Under a microscope, it can be impossible to tell which is which or if they're doing something we don't want them to. To analyse all of the life forms in seawater, we can measure their DNA. This is a chemical found inside all biological cells which carries instructions for making a living thing. This genetic code changes from one species to another and by looking at this code from the microbes we collect with Roxy, we can gather extremely detailed information on life in the ocean. As we go forward, we will use new machines called DNA sensors, which can be sent out into the ocean, much like Roxy, to study the genetic code of microbes at the place they are collected. This means we won't need to transport the samples to the laboratory or even need a scientist to do all of the experiments. However, DNA sensors are still at an early stage but other types of sensors are already being sent around the ocean to do research and will be increasingly important for the future of ocean exploration. This is an example of a sensor that can be deployed in the ocean today, either on Boaty or another platform, for long periods to measure the chemical makeup of seawater. The seawater chemistry is important for studying almost all aspects of the ocean, including its microbiology. This sensor and others work as a lab on a chip, meaning that they can carry out all of the work that would normally be done in a lab and by a scientist, but automatically on a small disc, which we refer to as the chip. Inside this disc are ultra small chambers and connecting tubes, which move tiny amounts of chemicals around. We call this microfluidics. These microfluidics mix seawater with different chemicals, which then change color depending on how much of a particular analyte, that's the thing we want to measure, is present in the sample. We can monitor this colour change by seeing how much light can pass through the chemical mixture. As we do more research, we can adapt these sensors to measure more and more things in seawater, which means we will be able to build up a better overview of how the oceans behave, 
their health and understand better how we can manage problems like global warming, climate change and pollution. As we move into the future, we will see increasing numbers of these samplers and sensors sent out to make measurements, which means places where we at the moment have very little information or data to use the scientific term will become increasingly understood. And as we start to build a greater understanding of our own oceans on planet Earth, these tools could someday soon also be applied to study oceans on other planets, including those in our own solar system. We know, for example, that Europa, a moon of Jupiter, has a salty ocean probably 50 miles or more deep, but which is beneath approximately 10 miles of ice. It would be almost impossible for a human to visit there using existing technology, but with a family of auto sensors, it may be possible to start planning how these systems could be used to find underwater life elsewhere in our galaxy. Thank you for joining us today at the National Oceanography Centre and for taking the time to listen to us. If you have any questions, please enter them into your chat box now.